Welcome to Brain Imaging Essentials, Part 2, Brain Imaging Anatomy. I am David Lee Gordon, Professor of Neurology. The learning objectives for Brain Imaging Essentials, Part 2, Anatomy are, upon viewing this presentation, learners will be able to identify neurologic structures on brain CT and MRI scans, including the brainstem with its three components, medulla, pons, and midbrain, and the cerebellum, Cerebral spinal fluid structures, including all four ventricles, the sylvian aqueduct, quadrumental plate cistern, perimesencephalic cistern, supercellular cistern, sylvian fissure, and interhemispheric fissure, deep white matter in the cerebral hemispheres, including the corpus callosum, internal capsule, coronal radiata, and centrum semiovale, the subcortical gray matter, including the thalamus and lentiform nucleus, which consists of the globus pallidus and putamen, and the caudate nucleus, and the cerebral cortex, frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital lobes, and the insula, and arteries in the brain, circle of willis and arterial branches, the middle cerebral artery, the anterior cerebral artery, and the posterior cerebral artery. When identifying anatomy on brain imaging, it is best to keep a three-dimensional perspective, and that means understanding the way the brain sits in the three cranial fossae. Progressing from inferior to superior, axial slices first visualize the posterior fossa. So slice A is the most inferior slice, and you can see the posterior cranial fossa outlined in orange and shown with the orange arrow on slice A. The next slice up, going higher, the axial slices go through the middle cranial fossa, outlined in green and shown with the green arrow on slice B. Then higher up, the axial slice shows the anterior cranial fossa, where the frontal lobe sits. And this is outlined in yellow, with a yellow arrow. So as you go up from the bottom to the top of the brain on axial images, you'll see the brain stem in the posterior fossa, then the temporal lobes in the middle cranial fossa, and then finally the frontal lobes in the anterior cranial fossa. We will now view multiple CT scan axial images in the same patient, demonstrating normal anatomy. In the upper right corner, each of these slides is a sagittal MRI showing you the level of the slice depicted. On this image, see if you can identify the structures listed on the left before proceeding. I'm guessing you had minimal difficulty identifying the nose. The eyes also are not difficult to identify. Note the hyperdense or white oval-shaped structures in the anterior aspects of the eyes are the lenses. The sphenoid bone is one of the bones that forms the orbit. Here, the inferior aspect of the temporal lobe is seen in the middle cranial fossa. The bony clivus is anterior to the brain stem. The word clivus means slide. It sits at an angle in front of the brain stem, and the basal artery courses rostrally between the brain stem and the clivus. The clivus will extend up all the way to form the cella tercica. In addition, the sixth nerve, cranial nerve six, exits mid-pons and travels up the clivus before entering the cavernous sinus. The Peter's bone, or the Peter's aspect of the temporal bone, houses the inner ear. The arrow on this slice is pointing to the black mastoid air cells. Recall that air is hypodense or black on a CT scan. The mastoid air cells are thought to help regulate pressure in the ear and can become infected when ear infections spread to the adjacent bone causing mastoiditis. This can then lead to cerebral vein thrombosis because a sigmoid sinus is runs along the inner groove of the bone where the mastoid air cells are. 
the pawns is seen in the center of this slice. Remember the word pawns means bridge in Latin, and it bridges the two other components of the brain stem, the medulla below it and the midbrain above it. When you see the pons on an axial image, of course, behind it lies the cerebellum. Please also note that the cerebellum crosses the midline. There is no fissure in between the two sides of the cerebellum. This is a slice more rostral, as you can see in the upper right corner. Again, on the sagittal image, mid-sagittal image, you see a slice level where the slice comes from. Pause for a moment and take some time to see if you can identify the structures that are listed on this slide. The eyes are once again easy to identify. Note now that the image is slightly asymmetric. You can see the lens is still partially seen in the right eye and not seen at all. We're above the level of the lens in the left eye. The optic nerve is the structure entering the eye posteriorly. Note that we only see the right optic nerve, not the left optic nerve, because of the asymmetric way the slices were obtained. The lateral rectus is the muscle lateral to the eye that AB abducts the eye. The medial rectus is the muscle medial to the eye that adducts, adducts the eye. The sphenoid bone is seen once again, forming the posterior lateral aspect of the orbit. At this level, we more clearly see the temporal lobe in the middle cranial fossa. Note the streaky bony artifact obscuring the parenchyma in the temporal lobe. The cella tersica, which literally means the Turkish chair, houses the pituitary gland. Dorsum celli literally means back of the chair. This is the bony extension of the clivus that does serve as the back of the cella tersica. Once again, we see the petrous bone forming the posterior aspect of the middle cranial fossa. Once again, we see the mastoid air cells. Here we see the pons in the middle of the brain stem, the faint, slightly hyperdense round structure in front of it is the basal artery between the pons and the dorsum celli or clivus. Brachium pontus literally means arm of the pons. As you can see, it's an extension connecting the pons to the cerebellum. It is also known as the middle cerebellar peduncle. The fourth ventricle lies posterior to the cerebellum and anterior to the vermis of the cerebellum. It is black because it consists of cerebral spinal fluid. The cerebellum lies behind the pons in the posterior fossa. Note that the cerebellum parenchyma goes across the midline. The central part of the cerebellum is called the vermis. There is no fissure or CSF structure in between the two sides of the cerebellum. We are now one slice higher up. See if you can identify the structures listed on this slide before proceeding. The frontal sinus is an air pocket within the frontal bone. Thus, it is black or hypodense on CT. At this level, we see the orbit above the eye. At this level, we are now able to see the frontal lobe in the anterior cranial fossa. The sylvian, or lateral fissure as it is sometimes called, is the largest fissure in the brain. At the level of this slice, it separates the frontal lobe anteriorly and the temporal lobe posteriorly. The middle cerebral artery runs in the sylvian fissure. 
Here you see the relatively hyperdense carotid artery in the circle of Willis. This is the temporal lobe. Anytime you see the sylvian fissure on an axial image, posterior to it will be the temporal lobe. Note also the very medial temporal lobe forms a little knuckle protrusion that is sometimes called the uncus, U-N-C-U-S. The supracellar cistern, the large central cerebrospinal fluid space above the cella, has six points. The point at the top, most anteriorly, is the interhemispheric fissure. The upper corners go to the sylvian fissures. The bottom corners go to the perimesencephalic cisterns. And the most posterior point centrally is the interpeduncular cistern. The perimesencephalic cisterns are CSF spaces surrounding the midbrain. In fact, peri means around, mesencephalic means midbrain, around the midbrain cistern. Another name for it is the ambient cistern. The posterior cerebral arteries run in the perimesencephalic cisterns. The perimesencephalic cisterns commonly fill with blood during subarachnoid hemorrhages and also become obscured when the temporal lobe, specifically the uncus of the temporal lobe, herniates and compresses down on the brainstem during uncle or transtentorial herniation. We are now at the midbrain level of the brainstem. The midbrain is recognizable by the two uh, smaller lumps dorsally or posteriorly uh, called the colliculi and more anteriorly or ventrally the larger uh, rounded lumps as it were uh, that form the cerebral peduncles. Just dorsal to or behind the midbrain is the CSF space called the quadrigeminal plate cistern. It is called this quadrigeminal, four twins uh, plate cistern because of the four colliculi. So there are two superior colliculi in the midbrain and two inferior colliculi. Remember, colliculus means hill in Latin. So these little bumps, four bumps on the dorsal part of the midbrain, or four twins. And this term, quadrigeminal plate cistern, refers to those colliculi, four twins. That the twins uh, area, the quadrigeminal plate, is also known as the tectum. The tectum means roof, and it's called that because it roofs the sylvian aqueduct, which lies in just beneath those colliculi, just beneath the quadrigeminal plate. This quadrigeminal plate cistern is commonly filled with blood during subarachnoid hemorrhages and may be obscured when there is diffuse cerebral edema. The cerebellum lies posteriorly or dorsally to the brainstem still. Note that there is still parenchyma centrally, medially, in the cerebellum. That's the clue that you're not yet up in the occipital area. The occipital area would have a fissure between the two sides. Cerebellum does not. It has parenchyma in the middle, medially called the vermis. We continue to move rostrally and now on slice four. See if you can identify the structures listed on this slide before proceeding to the next slides. Anteriorly or ventrally at this level, we see the frontal lobe. In between the frontal lobes, we see the CSF space called the interhemispheric fissure. 
at this level, we continue to see the sylvian or lateral fissure separating in this image the frontal lobe from the temporal lobe and again where the middle cerebral artery runs. In fact, we do see the middle cerebral artery, this isodense tube running from the circular willis into the sylvian fissure. At this level, laterally, we see the temporal lobe. Once again, if you see the sylvian fissure on an axial image, just dorsal to it will be the temporal lobe. These small slits of black CSF space in the temporal lobes are the temporal horns of the lateral ventricle. In normal patients, these temporal horns are very small. They only become enlarged with diffuse atrophy of the brain or focal atrophy of the temporal lobe or when there is compression on one side leading to hydrocephalus on the other side. But normally the temporal horns are small slits within the temporal lobe. Here we see the posterior cerebral artery, an isodense tube coming from its origin in the basal artery and beginning to wrap around the midbrain and about to enter the perimesencephalic cistern. Here we see more clearly the six-pointed star called the supracellar cistern. Once again, uh, the cistern point ventrally or anteriorly goes into the interhemispheric fissure. The ventral corners go into the sylvian fissures, the dorsal corners go into the perimesencephalic cisterns, and the most dorsal point uh, goes is actually the interpeduncular cistern. The circle of Willis sits in the supracellar cistern. And once again, we see the perimesencephalic or around the midbrain cistern, or also called the ambient cistern, where the posterior cerebral artery will run, and which is again obscured when there is uncal herniation or full of uh, blood. It becomes white on a CT scan when there is subarachnoid hemorrhage. The interpeduncular cistern is the small CSF space in between the two cerebral peduncles of the midbrain. Often you might see the top of the basal artery here. At this level, we continue to see the midbrain now more superiorly, the superior aspect of the midbrain with its distinct shape. Eventually, we see the two rounded cerebral peduncles within the midbrain. And dorsally, we see the smaller humps called the superior colliculi. If you look very carefully, right in the middle of the two superior colliculi and maybe just ventral to those colliculi is a black dot, which is the sylvian aqueduct, also known as the cerebral aqueduct. Still at this level, we see the CSF space behind or dorsal to the midbrain called the quadrigeminal plate cistern. At this level, we see the parenchyma right behind the midbrain, right behind the quadrigeminal plate cistern. It's still part of the cerebellum, and the central part of the cerebellum is called the vermis, which literally in Latin means worm. We also, at this level, however, see the occipital lobe behind the cerebellum. The cerebellum more rostrally uh, is peaked like a tent, and so you see the cerebellum vermis 
right behind the quadrigeminal plate cistern, but behind the cerebellum, you'll notice that there is a linear whiteness or hyperdense area right behind it that is dura. Uh, and so because you have this dural structure in between the two sides, you now have the occipital lobe. The occipital lobe is separated into two sides with a dura in between or fissure in between. Note the appearance of a wine goblet. If you look at this carefully, the vermis is the top of the wine goblet and the stem is the dura beneath it. When you see this you structure, you know that the wine goblet, the center, the glass of the wine goblet is actually the vermis. And, this, and behind it, where there's a stem, there's occipital lobe behind the cerebellum at this level. We continue to move rostrally. We are now on CT slice five. Take a moment to see if you can identify the locations of the structures listed on this slide. Ventrally, we continue to see the frontal lobe. In between the frontal lobes, we see the CSF space called the interhemispheric fissure. The anterior cerebral arteries run in the interhemispheric fissure. At this level, the sylvian or lateral fissure has a different appearance. Notice it looks more like a T at this level, separating the temporal operculum from the insula and frontal lobe. At this level, you might see small, round, middle cerebral artery branches within the sylvian fissure. At this level, we can see more medially now the third ventricle. We continue to see the temporal lobe laterally. Once again, if you see the sylvian fissure on an axial image, then dorsal to it will be temporal lobe. At this level, the temporal horn is seen more dorsally as it runs back to join the body of the lateral ventricle. Note that because this CT scan was obtained slightly asymmetrically, we only see the temporal horn on one side, but it is common for the temporal horn to be very small in a normal person without cerebral atrophy. Here we more clearly see the black dot uh, consisting of the CSF structure, the sylvian or cerebral aqueduct that is in the dorsal midbrain. This is that aqueduct that connects the fourth and third ventricles. We continue to see the vermis of the cerebellum right behind the quadrigeminal plate cistern or behind the midbrain, midline. At this level, we continue to see the occipital lobe behind the cerebellum. Once again, the wine goblet appearance tells us that the occipital lobe is there behind the cerebellum, with the glass of the wine goblet being the vermis and the stem of the glass being the hyperdense meninges or falks between the two cerebral hemispheres, between the two occipital lobes. Here we see the hyperdense dural structure called the falks in between the two cerebral hemispheres, in this case, between the two occipital lobes. And as mentioned previously, the falks looks like the stem of a wine goblet at this level. We now move one slice rostrally to slice six. Pause for a moment and see if you can identify the structures listed on this slide before proceeding. We continue to see the frontal lobe ventrally. We now see the black CSF space called the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle. Just lateral to the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle 
is the head of the caudate nucleus, a lighter gray structure because there are, it's composed of compact neurons and this forms part of the basal ganglia. At this level, we continue to see the sylvian or lateral fissure. At this level, the ribbon of light gray cortex just medial to the sylvian fissure is called the insula. The word insula in Latin means island. This area is isolated uh, between lobes and that's why it's called the insula. And it is a very important structure to look for in patients with middle cerebral artery infarctions. The external capsule is a strip of darker gray white matter that lies between the insula laterally and the lentiform nucleus medially. The lentiform nucleus is this lens-shaped or triangular-shaped light gray structure in the middle of the brain. It is part of the basal ganglia and consists of the globus pallidus medially and the putamen laterally. The posterior limb of the internal capsule is the strip of darker gray white matter that lies between the lentiform nucleus laterally and the thalamus medially. The thalamus is this oval or egg-shaped light gray structure medially in the brain. It serves as a relay station for sensation and consciousness and has other responsibilities such as uh, related to, to memory, etc. At this level, we continue to see the temporal lobe just dorsal to the sylvian fissure. The hyperdense white structure that appears to be floating in the third ventricle is actually the pineal gland. It is normally calcified and therefore bright on a CT scan. At this level, we see the atrium or trigone of the lateral ventricle. This section is called atrium because atrium means the central room of a Roman house. So this area is where the temporal horn and the lateral body and the occipital horn all come together into this central room called the atrium. Because three different CSF lateral ventricle structures enter this area, it's also known as the trigone. Again, the three components, lateral ventricle, body, occipital horn, and temporal horn all come together in this area called the atrium or trigone. In this image, we see a white or hyperdense area within the atrium. This is the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus makes cerebral spinal fluid and is commonly calcified, so will appear white on CT scans commonly. And it is commonly seen within the atria of the lateral ventricles. Dorsally in this image, we see occipital lobe. Note that there is falks or a hyperdense line between two, the two cerebral hemispheres throughout the posterior aspect or dorsal aspect of this image. Therefore, we are now above the cerebellum and in occipital lobe. We are not above the occipital lobe because we still see temporal lobe. So at the levels you see temporal lobe, the posterior or dorsal aspect of the brain will be occipital lobe. We now move one slice rostrally to slice seven. Pause for a moment and see if you can identify the structures listed on this slide before proceeding to the next slides. We continue to see the frontal lobe, the ventral aspect of the brain. 
The black CSF structure in between the two cerebral hemispheres is the interhemispheric fissure. The corpus callosum is the thick band of white matter that connects the two cerebral hemispheres. The anterior aspect of the corpus callosum is called the genu of the corpus callosum. The genu lies just anterior to the lateral ventricles. The posterior most aspect of the corpus callosum is called the splenium of the corpus callosum. The word caudate in Latin means tail, and the caudate nucleus is a tail-shaped structure that follows the lines of the lateral ventricle. Here, we still see the head of the caudate nucleus cut in cross-section. The caudate nucleus is part of the basal ganglia and is composed of densely packed neurons. It's a gray matter structure, thus the color is a lighter gray, just like the cerebral cortex. At this level, we see the body of the lateral ventricle, the large black CSF structure in the middle of the brain. The bodies of the lateral ventricle arch over the thalami, and on top of the thalami lie the choroid plexus. In this slice, we see the thalamus or choroid plexus seen as consequence of volume averaging, seemingly within the ventricle, but actually just beneath the ventricle. At the level in which you see the prominent curved bodies of the lateral ventricle, the deep white matter is called the corona radiata or radiating crown. Anteriorly, the deep white matter is called the forceps minor. This is the anterior aspect of the corona radiata emanating from the genu of the corpus callosum. Posteriorly, the corona radiata is called the forceps major, and this is the corona radiata emanating from the splenium of the corpus callosum. The area of cerebral cortex posterior to the central sulcus is the parietal lobe. This slice is still inferior enough to be able to see the occipital lobe in the posterior aspect of the cerebrum. The white or hyperdense line separating the two cerebral hemispheres is part of the dura called the fulcs. On a CT, the black or hypodense CSF filled wrinkles in the cerebral cortex are called sulci or individually a sulcus. We now move one more slice rostrally to slice eight. Pause here for a moment and see if you can identify the structures listed on this slide before proceeding to the next slide. The frontal lobe continues to be seen in the ventral aspect of the brain. We still see the black line of CSF in between the two cerebral hemispheres called the interhemispheric fissure. Once again, we see the band of white matter connecting the two cerebral hemispheres called the corpus callosum and the anterior aspect specifically called the genu of the corpus callosum. Note that at this level, one can appreciate the tail shape of the caudate nucleus. The body of the caudate nucleus at this level is easily seen to run along the lines of the lateral ventricle. We now are at the top of the lateral ventricle bodies. As long as we still see the bodies of the lateral ventricle, the deep white matter is called the corona radiata. At this level, the posterior part of the brain is the parietal lobe. We are now too rostral to see the occipital lobe. Once again, we see the hyperdense dural 
falks separating the two cerebral hemispheres. We now come to CT slice 9, the rostermost slice in this presentation. Pause for a moment and see if you can identify the structures listed on this slide before proceeding to the next slide. At this level, the cerebral cortex anterior to the central sulcus remains the frontal lobe. In between the two hemispheres lie both the interhemispheric fissure, a CSF structure, and the falcs, a dural structure. At this level, when we no longer see the lateral ventricles, the deep white matter is called the centrum semiovale because it is in fact in the central part of the brain and is semi-oval. The parietal lobe makes up the posterior aspect of the brain on this slice, posterior to the central sulcus. We remain too rostral to see the occipital lobe. To further our perspective of brain imaging anatomy, we are now going to review an MRI T1 sagittal view in the midline. Please know that the sylvian aqueduct is in the midline and is as thin as a pencil lead. So the presence of sylvian or cerebral aqueduct on an MRI sagittal view indicates that the slice is midline. As we go through the anatomic structures listed on this slide, we will eventually get to the structure that is in fact the sylvian or cerebral aqueduct. Pause for a moment and see if you can identify the structures listed on this slide before proceeding to the next slides. Fat is hyperintense or white on a T1 image. So the outermost white band in this image is the scalp. The next layer is the skull. And note that the skull has three distinct layers that are different colors on an MRI. The outer layer is black or hypo-intense, composed of calcified compact bone. The middle layer the white layer is composed of fatty marrow in the spongy bone. And then the innermost layer is also black, once again, composed of calcified compact bone. The front part of the brain is, not surprisingly, the frontal lobe. In the mid-sagittal MRI, we can now see the entire band of white matter called the corpus callosum including the anterior aspect called the genu and the posterior aspect called the splenium. In the midline sagittal image, we clearly see the top of the brain stem called the midbrain. The optic chiasm, where the two optic nerves cross, is seen here just above the cella. Sitting in the cella is the pituitary gland. Recall that normal blood flow is black on a T1 image. And here we see the long black tube lying in front of the pons and behind the clivus called the basilar artery. The middle part of the brainstem is called the pons, which literally means bridge, and it does in fact bridge the lower medulla to the upper midbrain in the brainstem. The clivus is the bony slide anterior to the basilar artery and pons, extending up from the vertebrae and with the skull posteriorly forming a canal where the brainstem and cerebellum sit. Superiorly, rostrally, the clivus extends up to form the cella, tersica, where the pituitary gland sits. This large structure in the mouth is the tongue. The supero-posterior aspect of the brain in this image is the parietal lobe. 
the sylvian or cerebral aqueduct connecting the fourth ventricle caudally to the third ventricle rostrally runs in the ventral aspect of the midbrain. Here you can see the very thin black line within the midbrain is the sylvian or cerebral aqueduct. The bumpy structures dorsal to the sylvian aqueduct are the colliculi, which means hills in Latin. This is also known as the tectum in Latin because tectum means roof and the colliculi form a roof over the sylvian aqueduct. The black tube in the midline running just underneath the scalp is the venous structure, the superior sagittal sinus. The posterior inferior aspect of the cerebrum on the mid-sagittal image is the occipital lobe. It lies posterior to the parietal occipital sulcus. The black tube running just inferior to the occiput and superior to the vermis of the cerebellum running in the folds of the falcs is the straight sinus. This is a venous structure that drains the deep cerebral veins. The cerebellum lies inferior to the occiput, straight sinus, and tentorium cerebelli, and posterior to the fourth ventricle and pons. The midline cerebellum is called the cerebellar vermis. On T1 images, CSF is black, and here, this triangular-shaped CSF structure anterior to the cerebellum and posterior to the pons is the fourth ventricle. The medulla or medulla oblongata is the caudalmost aspect of the brainstem lying just superior to the spinal cord. This slide shows all of the structures on the MRI T1 sagittal view labeled with their arrows. After viewing this presentation, you should be able to accomplish the stated learning objectives reproduced on this slide for your review. This is the end of this presentation, a production of DLG Insight, Innovative Neuroscience Ideas and Thoughts on Education.